Good afternoon. I'm a public health physician brought on board by the Humane Society of the U.S. a few years ago to address the human health consequences of some of the ways we treat animals. And industrialized farm animal production is a good example from both an infectious disease standpoint, a chronic disease standpoint, and an environmental health angle as well, all of which I'd like to briefly touch on. By the end of this year, the lifelong confinement of pregnant sows in these so-called gestation crates pictured here will be banned throughout the European Union, and at the beginning of this year, these barren battery cages for egg-laying hens were banned by law in all 27 nations of the EU. So in the last five years, with both major changes in farm animal production practices on the horizon, millions of euros were spent intensely studying the food safety implications of transitioning away from cages and crates. What impact was this going to have on human health? Well, the greatest food safety burden in our country is salmonella. Uh, according to the FDA, 142,000 Americans are sickened every year by eggs contaminated with salmonella. That's an egg-borne epidemic every year, the leading cause of food poisoning-related hospitalization, and the number one cause of food-related death. So what can be done by producers at the farm level to reduce salmonella risk? Well, that's what the European Food Safety Authority was interested in finding out. The EFSA is the kind of European equivalent of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they compared 30,000 samples taken from more than 5,000 major egg operations across two dozen countries, uh, 5,000 different farms, and this is what they found. So for the most common type of salmonella in eggs compared to cages, there's 43% lower odds of salmonella contamination in cage-free egg operation, 98% lower odds finding salmonella on free-range farms, and 95% lower odds on organic egg farms. And this is what it looks like kind of graphically in terms of salmonella risk. Uh, since that study was published uh, five years ago, or completed five years ago, there have been 14 subsequent studies published comparing salmonella rates in cage versus cage-free egg operations, and they all found lower rates of salmonella in cage-free. Uh, but why? Why this remarkably consistent finding of cage operations being so much riskier? Well, the EFSA analysis suggests three factors. Uh, the higher prevalence in cage flocks may be explained by the fact that these intensive systems have higher uh, risk of being infected due to, uh, number one, the, the sheer number and packing density of these animals. Number two, you know, cages can be difficult to disinfect, and so you know, salmonella has been shown to be more persistent in these caged flocks, uh, where um, uh, the infection uh, is, uh, is uh, less easily cleaned out. And number three, battery cage operations breed more rodents, flies, and other disease vectors. And this increased flock risk among the birds appears to translate out into increased human risk. In a prospective case control study published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, among those eating eggs, those eating battery cage eggs, twice the odds suffering salmonella poisoning, white or brown, eggs from hens in cages significantly tied to illness compared to eating cage-free or organic. This is why it matters where hospitals source their eggs. And this is why it matters where hospitals get their poultry and pork. We feed antibiotics by the truckload to farmed animals. Uh, here's the total amount of antibiotics uh, typically sold for all of human medicine every year. Contrast that to how much it goes to farm animals, mostly just to promote growth and prevent disease in such a stressful, crowded, unhygienic environment. Millions of pounds a year, and now we as physicians are you know, faced with multidrug-resistant bacteria and running out of good antibiotic options. As Britain's chief medical officer put it, every inappropriate use of antibiotics in agriculture is potentially you know, signing a death warrant for a future patient. Now such use has its opponents and its advocates. The feeding of clinically important human antibiotics to pigs and chickens just to fatten them faster is condemned by the American Medical Association, but approved by the American Meat Institute. The American Academy of Pediatrics opposed versus the National Turkey Federation. The American Public Health Association is against it, but the American Sheep Industry Association is for it. The National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine opposed the National Chicken Council in favor, World Health Organization on one side, the National Pork Producers Council on the other. Now, uh, to be fair, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association also in favor, along with the United Egg Producers. On the other hand, this practice has been condemned by nearly every medical organization in the United States yet industrial animal agriculture continues this dangerous practice. 
This pharmacological crutch is one of the reasons industrialized animal agriculture has been blamed for emerging zoonotic animal-to-human diseases, including swine flu, whose primary ancestor was the triple hybrid mutant that spread throughout factory farms in the U.S. a decade before a further reassortment went on to kill 12,000 Americans. I don't have time to get into swine flu, but I do have a whole presentation on DVD free uh, to anyone on the webinar today, just email me at mhg1 at cornell.edu. Um, uh, that's mhg, just a numeral one, at c-o-r-n-e-l-l dot edu. Uh, in terms of chronic disease, our number one killer is heart disease, which can be prevented, treated, and even reversed. Arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, with a plant-based diet but one can obtain many of the health benefits from a low-meat diet, not just a no-meat diet. Uh, Adventist II is the largest ever study of so-called flexitarians. Uh, you can um, see a significant risk reduction just moderating one's intake of meat. In this study, a semi-vegetarian was defined as someone who eats meat on a weekly more than, rather than kind of a daily basis. Not vegetarian, yet associated with significantly lower BMI, lower obesity risk, significantly less diabetes, and significantly less high blood pressure, the latter two top, um, two top killers in the U.S. Uh, you can uh, tell this is an American study because even the vegetarians on average were overweight. Um, as you can see, there seems to be a stepwise reduction in risk, though, as one gets more and more plant-based across the board. But you know, I wanted to emphasize that you know, one doesn't have to go all the way to derive benefits from cutting back on meat. The second largest study on flexitarians uh, released data on cataract risk last year, our leading cause of vision loss. Uh, you can tell this is a European study because the heavy meat-eating category is defined as basically just a single serving of meat a day or more. Those are the heavy meat-eaters. But compared to one or more of those eating less than half a serving a day, significantly lower cataract risk. Though again, you do see this kind of progressive drop in risk as one takes plant-based eating to more kind of, a, of an extreme. Uh, but on a population scale, even a 15% uh, risk reduction is huge. Let me share a quick public health success story. After World War II, Finland joined us in packing on the meat, eggs, and dairy. By the mid-1970s, the mortality rate from heart disease in Finnish men was the highest in the world, even putting us to shame, bumping us down to number two. Now, they didn't want to die, so they got serious. Heart disease caused by high cholesterol, high cholesterol caused by high saturated fat intake, so the main focus of the strategy was to reduce the high saturated fat intake in the country. Uh, so in this country, that would mean cheese and chicken, cake and pork primarily. So a berry project was launched to help dairy farmers make a switch to berry farming, whatever it took. And indeed, many farmers did switch from dairies to berries. They pitted villages against one another in these friendly cholesterol-lowering competitions to you know, see who could do best. All right, well, so how'd they do? An 80% drop in cardiac mortality across the entire country. With greatly reduced cardiovascular and cancer mortality, the all-cause mortality was cut nearly in half. And look, Finland is no land of vegetarians. This was just from them cutting down on saturated animal fat. We've got a whole presentation on DVD free, again, to anyone on this webinar today on the role plant-based diet that can play in preventing, treating, even reversing our 15 leading causes of death. Again, just email me your mailing address. And all of my nutrition work is available free on my website, nutritionfacts.org. In terms of environmental health, from the proceedings to the National Academy of Sciences, using a meat thermometer graphic to basically show that when it comes to three environmental catastrophes in the making, climate change, uh, biomass appropriation, and nitrogen mobilization, by 2050, if we rely on livestock, we're basically screwed, screwed, and screwed. But if we instead rely on plant protein, we'd be kind of in the green across the board. So not surprisingly, some of the world's largest environmental organizations, like Sierra Club, advocate eating less meat, suggesting that you know, a 20% drop in consumption would be like our entire nation switching to hybrid cars. And indeed, Dr. Pachari, the head of the UN Climate Change Panel, is quoted as advocating eating meat-free at least a day a week, and that's where hospitals can join in by promoting Meatless Mondays, for example. Sodexo right, uh, launched a Meatless Mondays initiative last year, promoting vegetarian options 900 hospital cafeterias. 
three-quarters of which found it easy to implement. There's signage available, uh, big pink pig paws, costumes, you name it. Or even better option, take the balanced menus challenge to reduce meat purchases you know, 20%. Right? Uh, we drop uh, meat consumption 20%. Again, we get that Sierra Club benefit of all switching to Priuses. Um, in terms of our team at HSUS, we've personally worked with hospitals coast to coast, large and small, in the Midwest, Deep South, you name it. Please feel free to contact us. We'd be happy to help. Email me, call me, anything we can do to support hospitals to provide healthier and safer options for the public and the planet. Thank you, and I'll uh, meet you back on the webinar.